This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hello and welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Trevor Cochran. It's great to be back with you this Monday morning and we have got a fantastic show for you today. Here's what's coming up. We've got uh, a little bit of a little bit to spice up your living space with indoor plants. What we'll do is I'll share with you some tips on how to get the very best results, whether you've got them now or whether you're about to put some in. We'll be joined by a great friend, Rowan Peterson from Garden Express. We'll be talking grevilleas a bit later on. He's got a great deal. And as always, I'll be answering your gardening questions. We've got plenty of prizes to win. Always got our packet seeds for you. So make sure you get your garden questions in. When you do, please make sure you post where you're from, what state, what city, ideally. Um, it's really, really important. And if you like the, the, the program as we're going along, then please um, hit that like button. It's always a good way to go. Now, shall we fly into this straight away because we've got questions coming in from all over the country. Uh, Anthony from Adelaide uh, posted via the Garden Express Facebook page last week. He's got buddleias and something is eating the leaves. Now they're looking like ghosts with just a few leaves. Wondering what I can use to stop that from happening. Well, that's a skeletizing um, caterpillar. And at the moment, you're probably going to find that the damage is already done. You will see them. They're a little tiny grub. And uh, the moth is active in the either early morning or just in the early evening. You can spray them with something like um, horticultural oil, so white oil or something along those lines. But the truth of the matter is that um, they're probably, they've probably already gone through their, their process. So I suspect that um, you'll find that they've gone. The only thing you can really do, cut them back. Uh, cut them back. Don't be scared to cut them back hard as well. And uh, that'll take all those uh, those leaves away. If there are grubs and caterpillars on them, then you can make sure that you actually get rid of um, those uh, those cuttings, those prunings um, via either the compost bin. So you get them really, really hot in there and just kill off any eggs. Um, hopefully that helps. Marisha in Perth. Hello, Marisha. Um, you've got a Hass avocado tree. Now, we've got a photograph here. You, see, you can send in photos. Remember that. Um, it's It's been growing under shade, but it hasn't produced any fruit over uh, the four years that you've had it. It was grafted and produces flowers every year, but no avocados. What am I doing wrong? My avocados right at this moment are just setting. But what happens with avocados is they tend to be biennial croppers. So every second year, you get a good crop. The, the next year, it'll be quite an average crop. In your case, you're getting none, and it, it sort of shows that you've got it under shade. And I suspect what's happening here is the pollinators are not getting in. And normally, bees would be a great pollinator, and they you will see some bee activity in an avocado tree, but it's actually flies that do most of the, the good work there. So um, my recommendation is you actually get the tree out from under the shade. It really probably should be in the sun. They will do okay in the shade, but does need some sunlight. I think that's where your, your problem lies. Um, now, uh, Danielle, we're not sure where you're from, Danielle. Do I know any website where I can identify prickles in my yard? I'm assuming that you've probably got something like Bindi in your lawn, I would think. Um, the best place to do that, of course, is right here. So send us a photograph, Danielle, that'll help you out. Grant, we're not sure where you're from either. How do I get rid of stink bugs on my orange tree? So that's the crusader bug. Now, there are sprays that you can get that will kill them off if they're doing a bit of damage. And, and often you'll see when the new growth comes out, it's damaged and deformed. And it's usually those crusader beetles that are doing it. But um, 
they sort of come and they go. And, and my suggestion would be that you actually just spray it again using white oil. So white oil or horticultural oil or eco oil or one of those oils. Um, spray over the foliage of the trees. Don't do it on a hot day. And um, that'll they don't like the, the, the oil getting on their feet, their legs and their body. So they'll get up and they'll move away. It's a good way just to deter them more than anything. Emma is from Adelaide. Hello, I've just moved house. The lawn is covered with prickles. It's a large lawn area. I'm wondering what will kill off the prickles and get the lawn growing. Okay, well, bad news is the prickles, um, they literally are going to, you can't do anything about them. They're there, they're already existing, and they're going to, they're going to be the base of seeds for new plants that'll start growing next winter. Next winter, probably in July, you need to get yourself a hose on weed and feed. It's the only way to get rid of those things and it will take the bindi out. Uh, what you should do right now is give your lawn a really good feed. So look at a complete all, all purpose lawn food. Um, something like Lawn Builder is ideal where you can, you can apply the fertilizer, you'll see pretty much instant results within the next week or so. But there is a hose on um, called Extreme Green and I would suggest that you do the Lawn Builder granule and you do the extreme green. You hose on now, get a really strong flush of growth and let the lawn builder um, granular do its job as well. And that'll be sustained growth. What you're doing is you're not really uh, getting rid of those prickles, but you're getting the lawn to, to grow over the top of them and that'll protect your feet. Uh, but the key is actually treating them in the middle of the year. So middle of next year, make a note in your diary, put it in your Outlook calendar, got to get out, weed and feed. It's really important. We're heading north from Adelaide all the way up to the Gold Coast now. I've just taken delivery of some four millimetre bird netting for our raised veggie beds. I'm worried on seeing, on, on seeing it is that it will exclude bees for pollination, but a wider one seems to be a bird trap. Any suggestions on how to, to let the bees in without? Yeah, so the four mil should still allow bees in, Glenn. It's, it's, um, it's small, but they're still, if they're active and there's flower, you know, good flower, um, they should still be able to get in and do their job. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I tend to think that um, the the flowers um, will bring those bees in through the through the netting. So you should be okay. Millie is in Sydney. I was wondering if African violets get seeds. Would you be able to get plants from the flowers of the little yellow ones? Um, I do know that they grow very easily from leaf cutting, and I've increased my plants that way. Just wondering. So Millie, yes, they do grow from seed. You can take those and you'll see them. They're a little yellow seed that sits in the flower, in the middle of the flower. Um, and once the flower has died, you can actually collect those seeds using a seed raising mix and high humidity. So we want one of those little greenhouses. Um, you'll, get, uh, you'll get them to germinate and you will get some really interesting variations. African violets have been bred so intensively that um, you tend to find the cross-pollination, you get all sorts of variants in them. Um, one thing uh, that everybody should know is if you've, if you've not grown African violets before, glass of water, cut the leaf off and put the leaf stem into the water and just keep that water topped up so they never dry out and you'll find within two weeks that little leaf stem will start dropping roots out of it and you'll have a brand new plant. It's, they're such an amazing little plant. They really are cool. Now, Claudia, we're coming back to WA to a suburb called, well, it's kind of, it's an uh, outskirts um, town, really, uh, Gidjiganup. Help, just when my roses are looking nice, I've noticed the buds are being chewed on. I found the culprit and Google tells me it is a Japanese beetle. How do I get rid of the critters? Okay, well, I'm, I'm not sure about Japanese beetle. I suspect what's chewing on your, um, on your rose buds is what's chewing on mine right now. And I've just picked it up over the weekend and it's chili mite and it causes the buds to be damaged, so they look like they've been sort of chewed. It, it'd be unlikely that it's Japanese beetle because I've never seen it here in WA um, doing that sort of damage. But what you do need to do is you do need to treat them, and the best treatment is actually one that is a systemic. My recommendation is you pop down to Guildford Town Nursery and um, you have a bit of a look in their range of uh, chemicals there. Maybe have a chat to one of the horticulturalists. There is a couple of systemics that are very, very effective and you should be spraying your roses right now. I think we might get an expert on in the next week or two to talk about chili um, thrips because that's what they are. They're actually a thrip 
and the kind of damage they're doing because if you don't treat them now, uh, it, it will ruin your roses. Um, so there's a few things you can do. I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, Kathy is in Melbourne. Uh, tomato plant leaves are starting to curl. How do I fix this? Well, it depends on whether they're curling up or whether they're curling down. If they're curling down, you may have red spider mite. If they're curling up, it's actually a nutritional deficiency. My recommendation at the moment would be that you dust them with Deris dust and at the same time, you or sulfur dust is, a, is also effective, but um, at the same time, you give them a good feed and you use a complete all-round fertiliser. Really, really important if you want to get great results. Okay, uh, where are we? So uh, we're with Martin in Sydney. Hello, Martin. Um, we've just purchased a home. Uh, it's north-facing to the rear with a pool. I'm wondering what plants you would recommend to plant on the other side of the pool glass fence. Garden bed is approximately 1.2 metres wide by about 11 metres long. So it's quite narrow. And, you know, when you've got a position like that that's, that's exposed, um, and you've got a pool you kind of want to have, I, most people anyway around their pools love to have a bit of a tropical kind of look. And I'm assuming you're going to go down that sort of path. So my recommendation would be doing some things like putting in golden cane palms, absolutely fabulous plants. They really do work well in that kind of environment with that sort of width. And um, uh, in, interspaced in amongst them, because you're in Sydney, you can be putting some of those slightly more tropical plants in like crotons, or maybe you want to think about cordyline terminalis. That's often known as the tea tree, but it comes up. It's a, it's got a beautiful variegated foliage, and it'll work really well. And then in underneath them, think about putting something like the sacred lily, the Incas, Hymenocallus speciosa, or Festalis. It's both of those are really good versions of it, and they will do really well for you. Kate has sent us in a note. I'm not sure where you're from, Kate, but thanks very much for your section on feeding native bird life, particularly mentioning not to feed them. Now, this was uh, on the weekend on the Garden Gurus. We talked about um, in creating habitats that are better for our native birds. And one of the big problems we do make is that we stick seed out for parrots or we stick um, honey out or fruit out for certain birds to try and bring them in or we feed ducks bread and things like that. None of those things, you shouldn't be doing any of it. So um, native birds really are going to be attracted by, uh, well, by those pollinating plants, those, those very high nectar plants, so grevilleas and uh, banksias and uh, the wattles at a certain time of the year can be very beneficial to some you want something that's constantly producing flower, ideally. That's why grevilleas are so good. Those those tropical ones are, are exceptionally good, you know, so, uh, providers of um, of nectar. So that's probably the first thing. The second thing is that if you're going to think about some of the things like parrots, then you want to think about eucalypts. You want to think about banksias, some of the big ones, banksia, the bull banksia, banksia grandis. Those varieties um, will provide seed as a source of food as well. So hopefully I've come up with a few ideas for you there, Kate, and thanks for that feedback. It's great. We've got a heap of more comments coming along or more stories coming along in coming series of the Garden Gurus that feature some pretty cute native wildlife. And um, if you needed inspiration to set up habitats that are really native wildlife friendly, then this will be it. Now, uh, let's have a look. We are going to have a chat about a product. I'm going to talk to you about indoor plants. One of the big problems we're getting with um, with people talking about indoor plants, I don't have one sitting around me at the moment that I could show you, but is uh, a lot of yellowing leaves, a lot of burnt leaves around the outside edge. And this is a fairly common kind of thing coming out of the winter. What's your indoor plants really need right now as we move into the warmer season? is new, fresh, high quality soil. And one of the big problems that people are complaining about when they when they bring plants indoors is fungus gnats, those little black flies that float around the outside of your, your indoor plants. Now, fungus gnats are there because they're eating organic matter and your indoor plants want new soil around the base. So what you want is a potting mix that's got coir, sphagnum peat, perlite, things that are going to improve water retention, but also allow very good airflow to the roots. Most indoors really need that. Um, so you don't want any compost, you don't want any pine bark in like the traditional potting mixes used to have. Um, 
You also want a controlled release plant food, something that's going to stimulate and sustain growth for a good six months. And this is where Scott's Osmocote Indoor Plant Premium Potting Mix really comes into its own. It's the one in the grey bag. You'll see it's about a 10 litre, I think. And um, it's absolutely sensational. You can see Nige is, uh, is doing the job here with a raphus palm. And this is the way that you really do get great results. Back it up with a little bit of pour and feed liquid fertilizer. So that's one cap of that per week um, in over the foliage or in around the base of the plant. And you are going to end up with the most amazing, happy, healthy indoor plants. And uh, it's all down to this particular potting mix. It's become, it's what the professional use in a, in a professional nursery. And this is the great thing about Scott's is that um, the, the evergreen um, range of products is one that is constantly used by um, professionals. And then they take, this is the evergreen people, take those potting mixes, put them into bags that are then available through outlets such as Bunnings. It really is a great way to get great results out of your indoors. So the combination of Osmocote Indoor Plant Premium Potting Mix and also that pour and feed going to deliver amazing results for your indoor plants. And I just want to show you this one because talk about amazing indoor plants. This is a really good example of one plant that's benefited from that sort of that sort of behavior. That's that Zamia coolus raven. So this what's incredible about this plant is the foliage is black. Um, there you can see, but the new foliage comes out green. And then as it matures, as it ages, it actually turns black. So you end up with this amazing dark architectural structural foliage. You can see it, just what a great plant that is. And the key to it is feeding it, not overwatering indoor plants. The biggest killer of indoor plants is probably overwatering and making sure you've got the right potting mix. If you've got indoor plants at the moment, pot them up, look for that. It's a really good way to go. Okay, we'll keep rolling along. Amanda is in Adelaide, uh, three corner jacks. How do you remove them from your lawn? We've had them for years, but now they're ridiculous. You can't walk barefoot across the lawn. Been told it's a waste of time to try and get rid of them. We're in the Adelaide Plains area in South Australia, so burning isn't an option. Any advice? It is definitely one of the worst um, thorny uh, prickles that you can get in a lawn or in a garden bed. And the only way to treat it is to use a uh, selective herbicide. But the trouble is you, you can apply it now. It's not going to make any difference at all. They've already formed you have to do it in the winter months. It's really important. July is usually the catalyst month when they start producing flowers and stop growing. And from those flowers is the seed and the seed is exactly what you're seeing. So it's that three pronged um, prickle that is just a nightmare. So, sorry, I can't help you now, but I can help you if you make a note in your diary to treat it. It's the same as with Bindi. That is the way to get rid of them. Carolyn is in Sutherland in New South Wales. I have a real issue with my roses. They were beautiful until about a week ago. They now have dead leaves and the rest are looking bronze in colour and branches are dying. Please help. I would love to see a photograph, Carolyn, because I'm going to be guessing, but I'm I'm assuming that you've been you've had some hot, dry weather and that you have red spider mite. That just when you talk about that bronzing in colour, it, it probably is what I, uh, if, if, if it is what I think it is, that's what's causing it. Um, if you could send us a photograph, I will double check and uh, and give you a, a firm answer on that. I hope that helps. Donna from Warren Bull in Victoria, my burgundy satanthus leaves are all starting to brown and die off. I thought it was gas heating inside, so I put them on the patio, but nearly lost it. It's is it overwatered? The answer is probably yes. They don't need a huge amount of water. They definitely need really good free draining soil. So don't let them sit in a, in a tray of water. It could have been the gas heating that started the, the demise. But um, what you should see is if you go through and cut the leaves off, you should see regrowth. And that's really critical. Again, um, this pour and feed, I'm going to show it to you. There you go. Pour and feed. That literally you take the cap off. Pour it into the cap, one per plant, uh, one one per pot, um, and do it on a weekly basis. And by the time that bottle's finished, your plants will be back and growing. I promise you, it's a really good way to go. 
Okay, let's go to Glendon Brook in New South Wales. Um, photo attached. This is an interesting one. Um, James has asked us about an English oak tree growing in the middle of a fruit tree orchard. That seems quite unwell. The oak was planted a few years ago before the fruit trees and the London plain next to it. Do you, you believe that this is due to competition with the other trees? It is growing in rich creek soil and has grown very quickly. It's only 13 years old, but it's getting up towards 20 metres in height. Now, in looking at this picture, I would think that it's got, it, there is some kind of root problem going on here. Uh, I've seen this with oaks in the past um, where they have this deterioration and you're not seeing any real strong recovery and, and, and regrowth. Now you can try and treat it by drenching the ground uh, with something called Yates anti-rot. It's, uh, it's a fungus, uh, I'm suspecting it's got some kind of fungal rot. It's a, it is a fungicide. There is, a, uh, there is another um, treatment out there for the same sort of thing, which is an injection treatment. Um, but uh, it could be competition, but it's more likely, I think it's a fungal disease and, and these trees seem to suffer it really badly and uh, drenching the ground with that. And then probably about a week later, give the, the ground all around the base of it a, a really good drench with uh, sea sole. And I'd follow that up a couple of weeks later with some more sea sole. And fingers crossed, you'll start to see a bit of a turnaround because um, that's a, not a healthy tree. Anyway, I hope that helps, James. Um, and again, folks, you know, hit like if you like the questions that are being answered. And, and secondly, most importantly, is um, if you've got something that's very sp specific like this, then send us a picture. Um, it's at, we're 9.25 here, 12.25 um, on the East Coast, and we are flying through. We've got heaps of questions, so keep sending them through. And of course, make sure you tell us where you're from, like Tyson has, Tyson's from Melbourne. Do you have any advice on growing carrots in the garden? I do. Carrots are one of those, those crops that you really have to um, cultivate, really have to get the soil at least that deep dug over and really have it loose and friable. Um, you can't cultivate the soil enough when you're growing carrots and then sow your seed. It's best to be grown by seed. It's the best result you'll get um, in little lines. And what you do is you let them sort of all germinate and then go through and just thin it out so that as the carrots start to grow, um, you should have a little bit more room. And then once they're about that size, you can start harvesting. But um, Tyson, cultivate the soil, wet it down, sow your seeds, wet it down again, and then six to eight weeks later, you'll be harvesting. They're a really easy crop. Fiona is in Perth. When is the right time to split gerberas in Perth? Well, right now is a good time to split them up. Um, the other time is autumn. So if your plant's growing strongly and it's producing flowers, leave it. If it's, um, if it's uh, you know, probably, if it's producing buds or if it's looking like it's um, a little bit on the sad side, then um, you'd think about splitting it right now, I would think. But um, yeah, I, I would suggest autumn actually is my preferred time because you should be getting a lot of flower just coming through at the moment. Linda Cooper, we're not sure where you're from, Linda, but um, you, your problem's an interesting one. You've got a beautiful pink Singapore lily and um, your Singapore lily, I think we're gonna pop that picture up and it is not happy. In fact, the leaves are all curling this is the third year in a row. Now you've cut it off before it's got to six foot. I'm pretty sure it still flowered uh, last year with it. Seems okay. Now what's causing this twisting gnarling on these photographs? And if you have a look, folks, um, you, you won't see this. Not a bug that's doing this that's, that's really obvious and evident. But if you were to pull the leaf sheath down, you look inside, you're going to see mealybug. And um, mealybug is, looks like a white, almost like a white powder, I suppose. Um, when you have a closer look, you'll see little dots and those are the actual mealybugs. Now they damage the new growth tips as they come through, causing them to twist and gnarl. The only way to get rid of it is to use the systemic and Singapore lilies are, you know, Singapore lilies, uh, I've seen this with agapanthus. I've seen this with um, sacred lily of the Incas where it will cause this gnarling and twisting. It's quite common. So what do you, what do you got to do? Definitely, uh, you want something that's going to uh, move through the sap of the plant because it's almost impossible to get in and treat these guys. They'll be in the roots, they'll be right in the leaf axis. So it's very difficult to treat it, um, short of drenching with chemicals. Um, so systemics are the way to go. And you need to, Linda, pop into your local garden centre 
If you've got a Mitre 10 nearby, maybe have a look for MaxGuard because I think they still stock that. And that's exceptionally effective in controlling mealybug. I hope that helps. Caroline is in Perth. Hello, where can I buy a male kiwi plant? Bought a female one, but I haven't been able to find a male one. Well, kiwi fruit do require a male and female, so they're separate plants. Uh, the best place in Perth is probably going to be Tas1 Trees. So you want to head out there. Uh, Joe Tassoni is the guy out there who will help you find a male kiwi. And it'll be, you need to make sure you've got the right one too. So um, you tend to find you've got to have a Bruno and a Haywood. Let, um, let uh, him probably give you that advice. If you know what your female is, it will also help. Lynn is in Claremont. We're staying in Perth at the moment. I've got a North Facing Garden. Would like some ideas on what to plant. So North Facing Gardens uh, have great advantages because they're warmer. They're, they're always exposed to the sun. Uh, the soil tends to be warmer. And they tend to be, in Perth, protected from uh, from the breeze. So there's three things going for you. The only thing is that peak of summer, that's so red hot, um, they can be quite problematic. Things like roses love that kind of environment. They love hot, dry conditions. So, Lynn, you could go down that line. Certainly, um, you know, if you're thinking about annuals, um, Petunias can't go wrong. Um, vincas can't go wrong. They love those those climatic conditions. If you're if you're thinking something a little bit more tropical, then think about things like those. I talked about them before. Actually, golden cane palms love that environment. So there's a few sort of planting ideas, but the best source of advice is always going to be to go and talk to your local garden centre. And there's some really good ones in and around Claremont. I'd stick my head into Dawson's and explain the situation, take a couple of photographs, you should be fine. Caroline is in Melbourne. Hello, Caroline. So we've planted carrots. When do we know when they're ready to eat? And what causes them to be woody inside? So they get woody inside when they've been left in the ground for too long. Um, that's just a maturing thing of the root. Um, the trick is usually you can start harvesting about six weeks after planting. So the key here really is to make sure that um, you're checking them. And the way to do it is just to scratch the surface of the soil away. And you'll see the top of the head as the, as the growth comes in. You'll see the head. And if the head's about, I don't know what that is, that's probably about four, three, two to three centimetres across, um, pull one out and just test it. And that'll be that'll be the way to do it. Don't be scared. They really are very easy plants to grow. So um, that hopefully is of some help. Okay, Carenza is in Leshenault in WA. I'd like to know if I can transplant my mulberry tree. It's five years old and it is fruiting. Definitely can. Definitely not now though, Carenza, because what you'll find is mulberry trees are deciduous and when if you were to transplant it now it will shock it it'll drop all its majority of its foliage if not all of it and all the fruit which would be a tragedy if you can wait till winter time you can transplant them because they go dormant then and try and get as much of the root system as you can move it into its new home and you'll get a great result i actually uh, transplanted a massive one um last week it was uh, not last week last year and uh, I've, I've got some of the harvest, some of the fruit that I, I've got from this year's crop. And it's all about making sure you've got your timing right. So um, what have we two, gone through two winters with it now? It's recovered last year, produced some fruit. This year, it has produced masses of fruit, doing really, really well. So I think, um, I think I need to slow down a little bit. I've been answering a lot of questions. There's a lot going on. Uh, last week, we spoke about great plants for shaded areas. This week, we're thinking about summer and plants that are water-wise. And joining me to discuss that is my mate, Rowan Peterson. G'day, Rowan. How are you? Hey, Trev. How are you going, mate? Good, good. You know, um, we were just talking earlier on. A lady asked a question about um, the best plants to uh, attract birds into the garden. And of all the natives, and there's so many natives that all do wonderful things when it comes to... Um, bringing in really good, uh, you know, good food sources for birds. The best of the lot has to be grevilleas. They are just amazing. And and some of them will feed large birds and some of them will feed, you know, the, the big wattle birds and so on. And some of them will feed smaller birds. But one thing that most, most people don't realise is they provide an amazing habitat for birds as well. So the structure of the, of the shrub of a, of a grevillea is really good for small birds to be able to set up nests. So adding them into your garden now is a smart way to go. 
Absolutely, uh, absolutely, and we've got an amazing deal as usual. Um, we've got uh, five different um, cultivars, um, ranging from pinks to reds, um, um, starter packs, so 50 mil pots um, ready to put into the garden but with some great variety. Um, and it's a 25% saving this week, so you're going to get all five for just 25 bucks, which is even better. Wow. That's that's a great deal. Now the varieties you've got are Ivanhoe, Winter Delight, Bonnie Prince Charlie, which is a ripper of a of a of a shrub. You can see it there, um, Obtusifolia and Mount Tamboretha as well. So these are really popular varieties, and you can see the size of the flowers and how spectacular they are. Brilliant for the birds and also for the bees. Yeah, absolutely, and butterflies. Butterflies love them as well. So. Mm. Um, the, the one that you mentioned before, Ivanhoe, is rel relatively new cultivar and new to us this year. Um, it's a beautiful toothbrush-shaped um, uh, flower, so yep. a long, skinny one. Um, some people call them spider flowers, um, but it's really beautiful, um, and it, it will grow um, approximately three metres to five metres wide and high, so it's a nice, beautiful plant um, which will provide fantastic... Um, um, Habitat for for the birds, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah. No, look, it really is. Um, the the thing about grevilleas is the the profusion of flowers. So they produce so many over such a long extended period of time that they yeah. they really are a reliable food source. And there's a lot of people who have got beehives at home and and uh, you know that want to do the right thing by by bees and and obviously certainly birds and bring them into the garden. Grevilleas have got to be one of the very best deals. Now, you said $25 for these five different varieties, so it's a good way to get a lot of variety in immediately. Um, the great thing about Garden Express, mate, is you guys deliver them direct to the door, don't you? We do. We do. So place your order. We've got those here ready to go now, so um, we can have those out, um, you know, practically instantly um, ready to go straight into the ground. Um, as I said, it's a fantastic starter kit, if you like, or yep. start a set of plants um, with so much variety. Oh, that's interesting. Um, one of the things I was going to say is once you've got them, what, what's, what should people do when they arrive? Um, take them out of the take them out of the packaging. So we've got custom custom packaging that they're arriving. They'll come in. I don't actually have one here today. So usually I'd have one beside me, but I don't have one. So it comes in a nice uh, plastic um, um, pack. Uh, that fits yeah. The, yeah, fits the the pots in perfectly and protects them during the mail. So the first thing they want to do is is come out of that and get a good drink. Um, yep. But, but and, and then sort of get them into the ground as soon as you can from there. Um, um, now's the time to be planting them, obviously, um, and you'll get some fantastic flowers this time next year. Um, um, you can see Bonnie, Bonnie, Bonnie uh, Marie is uh, planting them in her garden, and uh, that's that's going to be a great foundation for um, for more food for birds and and uh, wildlife more generally. So, mate, yep. um, deli deliver direct to your door. It's twenty five dollars for five different beautiful grevilleas um yep. it is a starter, starter pack all they've got to do is go to gardenexpress.com.au that's it um there's a big banner on the web on the home page that'll direct you straight to the offer um as you saw there on the screen previously um and then yeah place your order and we'll get it straight out to you um awesome. and that's gardenexpress.com.au well done mate no, the, it's such a great place to be able to go shopping, pick a whole bunch of things, and then just have them delivered direct to your doorstep. I love the convenience and ease. And, of course, so does uh, just about everybody in Australia now. You guys are booming along, aren't you? Yeah, we're doing really well, which is which is fantastic. Um, one thing that's worth probably noting now is um, as we get closer to Christmas, um, it, it's time to sort of start thinking about get your, getting your orders in, particularly if if you're ordering something that's uh, for a gift for somebody that you want to arrive for Christmas. Um, yeah, sort of start to get your orders in, you know, from here on in. I think Australia Post are cutting off around about the 9th of December um, and it'll be a little bit earlier uh, for you guys over in the West, but being that it's coming from us here in Victoria. Um, yep. But, yeah, if you, if you want a guaranteed get your orders in, you know, ASAP in the next few weeks to guarantee Christmas delivery. Yeah, great, great advice, Rowan. Thanks so much for joining us today, mate. Have a great, have a great week. Always a pleasure, mate. Catch up with you soon. Thanks. Cheers. Great deal there from Garden Express. If you want to uh, get your hands on some gorgeous grevilleas, 
now is the time to do it because that is a great deal. Now, here at the Garden Gurus, we're all about innovation. We're looking for new ways to create beautiful and sustainable gardens. And here's a sneak peek of what's coming up on our next episode. Empty pots, fertilizer containers, even egg cartons. There are a number of ways that we can help reduce waste. So if you wanna learn how to reduce, reuse and recycle, join us this Saturday on The Garden Gurus. there you go don't miss us each week on channel nine and of course it does vary sometimes by state as to the time we're going to air in fact uh, channel nine are also playing a lot of past episodes on um, nine life and we're seeing lots of questions come through sometimes if uh, we're a bit slow on answering it's because we're still trying to work out which one went to air but anyway i'll do my best that's for sure um i want to talk to you about my plan of the week now you can see these here they are mulberries <laughs> And what an amazing mulberry this particular one is. It's very, very different. That's the, that's the leaf of the plant. You can see it there. You can see the little fruit underneath. They're not going to develop much bigger, unfortunately. But um, this is an Indian form of mulberry. And it's one of the earliest fruiting plants of the season. So, um, you know, whilst, say, things like strawberries and locusts are coming through, um, mulberries are the next one in the line and then it goes to apricots and, and and so on but this is so sweet so this is what's known as a chartout um, mulberry an indian white mulberry now you do get two types of white mulberry you get one that's a little short sort of traditional bit like the um the old english um mulberry the black black english mulberry um but these are long and narrow and here's the thing you can get the white and you can get a red. Now the red is very much, it's a dwarf plant. It doesn't get very big, it's probably a meter and a half by a meter and a half. Produces a fruit very similar, but bright red and it tastes like sherbet. This is sweet. In fact, this is about 90% um, sugar. So uh, sucrose, it is a natural plant sugar, but oh, so sweet and delicious. And here's the thing, to grow a plant, all you'd need to do is to quite literally take take that off. I haven't got my secretaries with me, but take that off, cut it off there, and pop that in the ground. And as long as you've got a node on the bottom, like that node there, it will drop roots out the bottom, and you'll have a brand new plant. These things grow like crazy. They don't need to be grafted. They just need a sunny spot in the garden, and they will do incredibly well. So chartout mulberry or the the white chartout mulberry more specifically um absolutely delicious and fabulous for making um or to having within desserts and anything that's really sweet that you really want something nice to um to happen with okay let's get back into the que into questions because there's a lot coming through remember please tell us where you're from it's really important we're getting Questions coming in from all over the country at the moment, which is fabulous. Linda is, um, I'm not sure where you're from, Linda, but you've brought up about the Singapore lilies. So we're, we're talking about these, um, uh, these beautiful, um, quite large lilies. Um, member of the lily family, they are, there's a, a, a few different colours. Uh, when they talk about the Singapore, it's generally the pink flowering form. And again, distorted curled leaves now um it's just one of um a bunch of them apparently the others are seven foot tall with 30 plus flowers this one's distorted sounds like it's stunted and sending us a photo would help but i'm gonna i'm gonna take a a, a guess and suggest to you that it may have been hit by some herbicide it sounds to me that's more like a herbicide kind of problem than a mealy bug kind of problem um, but to check pull a couple of the leaves off the base and have a look at the base and see if you can see any of that white, furry, fuzzy kind of um, uh, insects on the inside. And if you're seeing those, you've got mealy bug and they'll be in the growth tip and that's causing the leaves to, to contort and, uh, and, and curl. Uh, that's when you treat with uh, systemic insecticide. But I think this could be, I think it could be a problem with um, coming in contact with something like either 
um, a weed and feed. Often people go out and weed and feed their lawn, but there's a bit of wind around and um, a bit of overspray comes in and that can cause a, a big problem with these sorts of plants. They will grow out of it typically. So it should get better. It might just be slower than the others, Linda. I hope that helps. Nicola is in Melbourne. Hello, Nicola. My fig tree is producing mushy fruit that's um, ah, that seem almost hollow. No evidence of bugs and foliage looks healthy fed last month. Early season figs can often do that. So um, I tend to find that my, my fig run really doesn't really happen until sort of Christmas, until after Christmas, ideally. And then I'll find that that's when the fruit um, is not hollow, is not dry, and it shouldn't be mushy. That mushy bits are a little bit of a... Um, little bit of a, a problem because typically they would go mushy if they were being infected by fruit fly but you're saying there's no evidence of bugs so maybe split them open have a bit of a look inside again and see how we go rick is in sydney is there an organic alternative to kill the orange bugs on my fruit trees uh rick it depends on how bad the orange shield bugs are they can be quite problematic to get rid of there's not too many natural solutions that I I can put forward. Um, certainly, you know those ones, those strong pungent sprays of garlic and chili may assist, and it's probably worthwhile just trying some of that. Um, you can make it up yourself, so um, mix it all up, crush up the the garlic and the chili, put it in a blender so it's a a, a real sort of fine fine mix, then pop it into um, into water and um, put a little bit of olive oil in there. And then using ideally a little hand sprayer, but if you've got a big tree, then it might be difficult. Um, then get some spray onto the tree and then just have a look and see whether they're still active the next day. They should move pretty quickly. Obviously, don't spray if it's if rain's coming because this will just wash off. Hopefully that helps, Rick. Uh, Laura is in Dayborough in uh, Queensland. Can you recommend any flowers, shrubs that grow well in all shade? As I've got a large area um in my front yard that is in all shade due to lots of trees well there's a lot of plants that grow very well in that sort of environment and you know straight off the top of my head clivias as far as the ground cover goes can't beat them so clivias are uh, the sometimes known as the kaffir lily or the fire lily gorgeous flowers in the early spring late winter um then lush dark green foliage for the rest of the time if you um i'm not sure about Deborah, but you could grow things like um, the, one of the plants that loves this sort of environment the best is azaleas. They, as long as you can get moisture to them and there's a bit of decent soil underneath, um, they will be fabulous there. And there's some varieties that flower all year round. So straight off the top of my head, there's two for you to think about, uh, Laura in Deborah in Queensland. Tabitha, we're not sure where you're from. Can you help me with a fairy floss eucalyptus? It is dying. We planted two at the same time, one's flowering, but not the other. I wonder why it's dying. It's really probably going to get down to the root system and what you have done with regards to soil improvement when they went in, Tabitha. Um, every once in a while, this happens. My suggestion to you is that um, I reckon you're better to go and buy another one, take the one out that's not performing, dig the soil out, put some really good planting mix in and get the new one in and it'll catch up to the other one pretty quick. Erica, again, unknown, not sure where you're from. Is it good to soak banana peel in water and then pour the water on plants? I don't know why you would do that, Erica. Um, it's interesting. Now, banana peel is, uh, is meant to be famous for being very high in potassium, and uh, that may be a, a slight benefit, but to be quite honest, uh, the answer is no. What I would do with my banana peels is I'd pack them in behind the shields on my staghorn ferns, and stand back because that does make a great fertilizer for ferns so you can do that another thing is you can use it to trick some of those plants like um, bromeliads that need to be stimulated into flower you can trick them by putting banana peel in around the base of them and then a plastic bag over the top and leave them for a couple of weeks and you'll find that um, the ethylene gas as the as the banana peel breaks down as a trigger for the the um for the bromeliads to come into flower Hopefully that helps. Greg is in Parkville. We have a glass house that currently gets way too much sun, defeating the purpose of it as it cooks everything in it. Ideally, how much direct sun, if any, would work? I have tried shade sails, but not working. We're definitely going to move it somewhere that 
maybe just has morning sun. Perfect. Mornings, what you actually want is you want morning sun, afternoon shade, ideally. There are some specific um, uh, interior shade materials that are reflective and they make a big difference on cooling it down. So you for, for glass houses, that's kind of what you need. They're kind of like a like a um, L foil kind of effect. So silver reflects light out, cools them down, does shade them quite heavily. And you need to go to a, a, a glass house specialist as such. So you might want to contact somebody like Sproutwell Greenhouses. They're pretty good. Um, or maybe just do a little Google and have a look in your local area as to who may be able to assist you. Who is a glass house specialist? That's really important. Margaret, unknown, can you help me with suitable fruit trees or bushes to plant along my fence line for privacy? I want some wow plants when I walk into my backyard and I thought it may be, I thought maybe a Chinese set of tree, native frangipani or native gardenia. I also wanted it to be bee attracting tree if possible and trees that are safe for storms. It's a fairly specific sort of um, request coming on there, Margaret. Um, I think if you've got a plant along your, your fence line, the ones that you've suggested are probably pretty good. The native frangipani, native gardenia are sensational plants. And even if you if you really want to bring bees in and you want to bring birds in, um, then planting multiples of them along the fence line would be a great way to go. You can also do things like um, if you want to bring birds in and, and bees, uh, you can think about um, some of the viburnums. They're pretty good. There's some. There's a few different forms that you can use that produce lots of wonderful flower, make a great hedge as well. Um, and there is a bit of wow factor with viburnums. They can be quite quite special when they're in full flower. Um, and I was going to suggest to you that um, th there's probably actually a few of them that you want to go and have a look in your local garden centre, to be quite honest. Have a talk to them. Uh, if you're going to go down the idea of native French panties and native gardenias, then you probably want to be hanging out in the native section because there's some beautiful small dwarf grafted eucalypts as well that have got stunning flowers that would make uh, you know a great addition to that kind of planting. Hopefully that helps. Samantha, um, if I planted heaps of broccoli seeds in the same hole, will they grow or do I have to separate them? Uh, the answer is you really only need one plant um, one broccoli plant. So you really want to, when they start to sprout, pull them apart, just gently tease them apart and spread them around the garden or put them into pots and they'll all produce beautiful broccoli. That's my bit of advice for you. Rachel, my peace lilies keep turning black. Can you tell me why? Generally, they do that because there's too much water. So soil with peace lilies has to be open and porous. They need to be moist, but not too wet. If they're saturated, it's a big problem. Hopefully that helps. Again, please let us know where you're from. Um, it's a really important thing. It is. Um, it makes such a big difference in the way I answer your questions. Now, Karen, for example, she's from Western Sydney. Can you re uh, recommend any shrubs about 1.5 metres high for my new garden? I love natives. Well, we just talked about grevilleas and some of those what I call tropical grevilleas. Those are the bigger ones with the big flowers. They are sensational, really, really beautiful. There are a lot of different types of native plants and the best thing to do is to get into your local garden centre and explore. Um, really, really critically important that you um, you have a look at, at a diversity of options out there. So dryandras, banksias, grevilleas, hakeas, they are all wonderful plants. And there's a lot of them sit at that sort of 1.5 metre high range. And they'll bring in heaps and heaps and heaps of birds and bees and just you know a lot of joy for you this time of the year in particular. Rucky is in Nelson Bay. How do you get rid of pennywort? Well, some people would be you know, they'd want to they'd kill to be able to um, to have that much of it, but uh, it is a it can become a bit of a pest as far as a ground cover goes. Um, the solution to it is probably going to be digging it out. I'm sorry, it's not not the one that you probably want to hear. You don't really want to be spraying anything over it. Um, there is one other way to do it, and that's to turn the water off because it doesn't handle uh, dry conditions at all well. So if you make sure the sprinklers are not on, wherever the sprinklers are not on, it will die off, and it doesn't come back. So it doesn't have rhizomes under the ground or anything like that that's going to keep it um, bouncing back. It should set it back a fair bit. You can mulch over the top of it as well. So 
Um, we've got seven minutes to go and we've got a few questions here still flowing through. It looks like everybody in Sydney is asking questions today. Samantha, we're not sure where you're from, but can grass grow on clay? So it's a pretty generic kind of answer. Um, typically clay gets very, very hard during the summer and it's not very uh, aerated. So all plants, all their roots need is a fair bit of soil, uh, a fair bit of air in the soil. Um, when you've got clay, it's very compacted. What you should be thinking about doing, Samantha, is forking some holes all the way through the area where you're going to lay the grass out. Then get yourself something called gypsum. Now, gypsum is a natural product. It's sold sometimes as clay breaker. And what it does is it, it literally uh, crumbles the clay up. It causes it to, to bind in little balls and opens it up, adds some structure into the soil. Then what I would do is put down a, an, a layer of an organic compost over the top and then I'd lay my lawn down and your lawn will do okay under those circumstances. It should break the clay up enough for it to be able to sink its roots in relatively deeply. But what you will find is on very hot days, your lawn may start to stress quite badly. There's not a lot you can do about that because that's just one of those things with clay. The reverse to it is in the middle of winter, you might find it gets quite waterlogged. It's just the soil you're dealing with. Hopefully that helps. Agnes is in Wetherill Park. Hello, Agnes. I have three orchids and I planted them in the same pot. Is that okay? It probably depends on how big the pot is and what type of orchids they are. Now, if they're all cymbidiums, that's fine. As long as there's a bit of room in there, um, that'll that'll be okay. But if you've got a cymbidium and, I don't know, a dendrobium and a, a, a phalaenopsis, um, they've all got very different growing uh, requirements and it's probably not the ideal scenario. So have a bit of a look at it. If it's one type, they should be fine as long as there's enough room for them all to grow. Millie is in Sydney. Um, we've got five minutes to go. This is your last chance. Get your questions in. Uh, Millie is in Sydney. Is it true that certain plants help you with your night's sleep if you grow them indoors? Say like aloe vera, snake plant, or uh, snake plant is also known as mother-in-law's tongue. Um, I've certainly never heard that with regards to... Um, those two plants, aloe vera and mother-in-law's tongue. The only thing they're really going to do is they're going to clean the air. So you're going to have more oxygen in the air. And that's one of the great reasons that you want to bring more plants inside because they're a wonderful um, fil filter for, for plants in an indoor situation, for air in an indoor situation. They take all the, the baddies out of the air, put lots of oxygen in. When the oxygen's in, in the environment, you should sleep really well. Plants that do um bring on a sense of, of relaxation and, and better sleep patterns are things like lavender and also chamomile. They're both two really good ones. Not necessarily the best indoor plant, but what you can do though is have them outdoors during the day and at night bring them in and pop them alongside your bed and you will sleep better. They really are um, a wonderful relaxant and of course they, they, that, that fragrance and perfume is really good. Now, Lindsay, you've got to have, that's got to be the question of the of the week, possibly the question of the year. What impact does GMO, uh, genetically modified um, production, have on long-term outlook of farmers? Well, it's a good question, Lindsay. So if you're talking to canola farmers, about 90% of all canola in Australia now is it, being genetically modified. So um, and the reason they've done that is because they've been able to increase the cropping. Certainly in third world countries, the, the GMO com uh, companies that are doing this work are showing that they can increase the productivity on, on arable land dramatically by using uh, genetically modified plants, just increasing the crop, which helps feed the population. So there's a good argument in that space. The reverse argument is if we genetically modify something, what impact does that have on, on our bodies, on the environment that we, we live in? And uh, I think the, think the scientists generally would say the plants that are available genetically modified are not, uh, not really harmful or dangerous. Um, is that um, is that something I'm comfortable with? Probably not. I'd like to see a little bit more time, a few more trials and for us to get to the bottom of it. One very interesting story we did on this show, um, probably oh, could be six, nine months ago, was we had a scientist from Boston uh, in the US where they have been genetically modifying this particular case, ornamental tobacco, 
um, and taking a gene from a uh, fungus that um, is uh, luminescent at night, putting that into the tobacco um, and then showing that the tobacco actually becomes luminescent at night. It glows in the dark. And I think there's a lot of work being done in that space at the moment. Now, that's just interesting genetic modification. What we're worried about, I suppose, is if those plants breed and it spreads, is that going to um, be problematic? Are we going to change the way other plants are? And I don't know what the answers are to that. Maybe that's something we should look into and do an interview with uh, one of the scientists who work in this space. We'll have a look at that and talk to the team here after the show. Great question. Well done, Lindsay. Uh, Matthew is in Melbourne. Do all baronias have the same requirements? Yeah, pretty much they do. They they do love free draining soil, but they need it to be moist. They do not like to dry out. Um, semi sort of shaded positions, usually the best positions for baronias. And um, believe it or not, they do like to be fed and they do like to be cut back. So don't don't be scared to, to prune them. It's a really good way to go. Uh, Alison is in Pimpana in Queensland. Well done, Alison, on getting in. Is it possible to move a grevillea? We have a couple of which have been in for about two years now. We would like to relocate. It's unlikely that they will survive relocation. They do not like root damage. You can try um, by gently cutting a half circle of the root system and leaving it, soaking it with some um, sea salt and then leaving it for two to three weeks and then go and cut the other half and hopefully the plant hasn't shocked. If it hasn't and you've soaked that with sea salt, um, leave it for another week or so and then try taking the whole plant out and moving it. But your success rate is probably not going to be good. What you'd be best to do is probably remove them and put a couple of grevilleas in the spot where you thought you might put this one and you'll be guaranteed a good result. Rick, you are our last question today. Thanks so much for joining us. You're in Sydney. Why do carrots go floppy when you harvest them and put them in the fridge? Supermarket carrots last for months in the fridge. The trick is actually to get them, wash them, treat them straight away. When I say treat them, wash them straight away, clean them and get them straight into the crisper. It's the temperature that they're kept at that really does keep them really good. You will notice that they're in plastic bags generally um, in the supermarket and that plastic does also help um, protect them and just get them to carry on a little bit longer. It's a good question. Thanks, Rick, and thanks everybody for joining us. What a day. We've had so many questions. We really do appreciate you participating. And if we didn't get to your question today, we're really sorry. But the uh, good news is we will next week, I promise you. Now, Robin has been producing today. She's done a great job. She'll be sending a message out to our seed winners after today's show. The Garden Gurus, the TV series, is back this Saturday. We do play at different times around the country, so check your local TV guide. It is on Channel 9, so keep your eye out for it. And, of course, if you have missed an episode, you can always see it on 9now.com.au when you want to watch it. So it's always a good way to watch The Garden Gurus, um, the TV series. And if you want any more information, we always say this at the end of every show, you can always jump on our, on our website. It is a great resource. Um, it provides all sorts of information, videos, all sorts of stuff. TheGardenGurus.tv or our YouTube channel, TheGardenGurus.tv, plays our TV programs as well. So you can watch past episodes, you can watch current ones, you can do all sorts of stuff there as well. If you want to, you can listen back to today's live stream and catch up on previous episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Audible. The good news is I'm looking forward to seeing you next Monday myself for another session of The Garden Gurus Live. It's 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time and 9 a.m. for WA viewers. And, of course, everybody else, just uh, tune in wherever you are. We'd love to have you join us. Happy gardening, everybody. Have a great week. I look forward to seeing you next week, not this coming Saturday, for The Garden Gurus. See you then. This show is brought to you by The Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. 
Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website.